Rockabilly was on a jukebox and you heard Gene Vincent? Gene Vincent, right. What song was it? Bebop Alula. And you know, at, at, at the time, the whole punk thing was starting to go down in England, 76, 77. And um, it had worked its way into Manhattan. It certainly hadn't drifted out to Long Island, you know. And I just like the whole energy of it, the whole kind of cutting through all the crap, you know. And um, it was very foreign to me. I didn't really understand it. When I heard Gene Vincent, for some reason, I equated the two as being real simple and real direct and real ballsy. And uh, I just, the music just kind of sent me to the moon. I just thought, wouldn't it be great if I could make this a little more electric? You know, I mean, if, if you hear anything, you know, the original Rockabillies and the way we, we ever did it was, in, it wasn't very similar. It's similar in a certain way and then it isn't. So we, we made it a lot more electric. But I was just thinking, wouldn't it be great? I mean, nobody knows what this music is. And, you know, I would, I would ask my friends if they knew who Eddie, Co Eddie Cochran was, or Gene Vincent. Nobody ever heard of these people. And I used to go to these little specialty record shops and buy, like, you know, these specialty rockabilly records, all this crazy stuff. Billy Lee Riley, Flying Sources, Rock and Roll. And all this crazy stuff, you know, that all came out of Memphis in the 50s. Nobody knew what it was. It was just people screaming and yelling and guitars out front. You know, rock and roll. And um, I just thought it would be great, I mean, if, if I could kind of revamp this because it was real rock and roll. I thought it was really valid. I thought I'd really stumbled onto something that hadn't been discovered. Did, um, how long then did it, was it from that, that point of hearing Gene Vincent on the jukebox? Until the Stray Cats happened. How'd you find two other guys who shared your vision? Well, around 77, I guess, I started. Actually, I wandered into a bar pretty drunk one night. And I said, I said, eh, you know, I said, this, this garbage you got on, man, this is nothing. This is, this is ridiculous. And there was two guys playing like Misty or something. You know, you know, these poor guys just trying to make a buck. And I wandered in there drunk. And, because basically the bars wouldn't put me on because, you know, I didn't have uh, spandex pants and a bologna to stuff down it. No, I shouldn't say <laughs> No, really, the bars really wouldn't put a band on that didn't have its own lighting rig and its own PA system and the whole thing, you know. I just couldn't understand how bands could afford that whole thing. So basically I was an out-of-work musician and I, I stumbled into this bar and this guy kind of, I don't know, he just kind of thought, well, all right, if you think you're so great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put you on here on a Saturday night. And it was just like a little old man corner bar. You know, I call it like an old man corner bar because it was just like these guys would go to kind of escape their wives for a couple hours, get drunk and go home. So I had a folk guitar, or maybe I'd had my Gretsch by then I bought. And... Uh, I plugged it into a little, a little something called an Echoplex, which gave it a slap back repeat, and I plugged it straight into a little Fender amp. And it started just playing Buddy Holly songs, and a little bit of everything, really. Not just rock and roll stuff into the 60s, and you know, I Fought the Law. Just, just rock and roll, but a lot of rockabilly. And all of a sudden, like, a lot of kids started coming down, you know. A couple of the old men would stay <laughs> and then go home. And, um, I started pulling like these big crowds in this little corner bar. And um, people would kind of, you know, show up and they'd have, you know, these sort of pompadours and jean jackets and polo ties, sort of these rockabilly clothes before they became rockabilly clothes, you know, thrift shop clothes. I, I used to just wear the biggest suits I could find, the biggest baggiest suits I could get. And uh, this whole thing started to happen on this the south shore of Long Island. It, it, it didn't make any sense. It seems really, it seems really strange to think that something that you know was was born in Memphis, Tennessee, had a resurgence on Long Island. Yeah. Well, the closest I can figure it out to, I mean, when you tour the states, if you ask a kid in Memphis, Tennessee, nowadays, who Billy Lee Riley is or who Sonny Burgess is, I mean, they they don't know. I mean, it did happen in the 50s in the South, 
but that's about it. You know, it, um, I don't I don't think it's ever really gained any momentum in a place like Memphis ever again. Was it was it an entire? Thing? Can we take a break for a second? Yeah, she's gonna get on the belt and. Oh man, I'd like to keep going. Okay, we... well it's fine with me. We'll keep rolling. Yeah. No, go right yeah. ahead. This getting no, silly. Yeah. Okay. Um, was it uh, was it an entire thing with you, Brian? Was it the look and the music? I mean, or which came first, the music or the look? The music and the look came almost together. Um, uh, basically, I mean, it really all it really all boiled down to this picture of Eddie Cochran. It's a black and white picture. On, I, I think it's called the Legendary Masters. I, 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 he just looks so cool, you know. And I was like dressing up. I mean, I always, you know, I, had, you know, I got my, uh, my an earring when I was about 14. And I got my first tattoo when I was about 17. And I just always kind of, you know, liked um, kind of dressing up a little bit, looking a little different, I guess. Anyway, this look just said it all to me, you know. What was, what was, how did people react the first time you went out with the pompadour? Well, I never really wore a pompadour proper, really. I just kind of put a lot of grease in my hair and kind of just made it look wild. And, oh, I got a lot of, lot of, lot of problems. <laughs> I got a lot of stick, you know. Other than, um, other than the music that, you know, that you listen to by the guys, um, did, uh, had you, ever, have you ever, had you ever been to the South? Had you ever spent any time down there? Or did you, had you traveled much by this time? By, by what time? By the time, let's say, 76, by the time that this was all sort of starting to come together. No, I had never been out of the tri-state area. My grandparents had lived in Kentucky for a while, and they would send me up things, Indian things, and... Um, just, uh... <laughs> I guess we're taking a break. <laughs> well, that's just as well. We'll get started. Okay. Yeah, that we're all exhausted. <laughs> yeah. It's all yours, Pat. Hey, you fall asleep. Um, let's talk some more about rockabilly and, and that whole phase of your life. Who was your biggest rockabilly idol? Cochran. Which Eddie Cochran song? Anyone in particular? Oh, something else. Yeah. Well, the way he looked made me go out and try and look like him. I bought a guitar like his. And when I heard something else, I couldn't believe it was 25 years old. That spoke right to me, you know? All those songs. Summertime Blues, Come On Everybody. It was like he wrote those for me. Is, is, is Rockabilly Do You, Brian? I don't know if truest is, is the word I'd use. I, it's the, the art form that really got my blood boiling. Um, I love blues, I love Dixieland, I love jazz. You know, I love all those types of art forms. But rockabilly to me, because it was so raw, and like it had a beat to it, and it was exciting. It just had all the elements that, to me, make what rock and roll should be. You know, like blues is great, it's guitar player's music, it's moody, but um, it lacks that really drive and urgent beat. Uh, so pretty much, um, Rockabilly pretty much had all the, the elements that really got me, got, got, got me going, I don't know. You know. How, um, at, at the height of the Stray Cats popularity, how difficult was it for Always be compared to songs. Always be compared to a different art form. Was that hard? No, because I mean, um, uh, you know, being compared to people like Carl Perkins and stuff. I mean, I mean, those those are the guys that invented it. So that's, I think, the best thing. You know, to be compared to someone modern day, I think, would be maybe a little worse. You know, to have someone say you sound exactly like Bob Dylan or something, that would be like, oh, you know, what, what am I going to do? Try and sound different, but. It's it, it's a little different when it's 30 years down the line. It's it's um, it's kind of okay. Um, why do you think it had to happen in England first before it happened in 
I think it could have happened over here, but it didn't because record companies have changed a lot now. I mean, they they seem to be going out and seeing bands and listening to tapes. In, in the 70s, it was very closed-minded. Uh, record company executives certainly never came and, and saw me play. <clears throat> and England, the musical climate, while it's, it's pretty much always changing, that's a problem as well, I think, in England, is that, you know, everything is pop-oriented. There's no, there's no rock based audience there. Everything is pop, 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 turnover, turnover. But it's good to, to, to start out new bands since it's so concerned about that all the time. So uh, it really helped us out. I mean, that that's where we got our break. It also seems that the English have a real yearning for anything American. Like maybe the Americans yearn for anything English. Mm, they don't like to admit it, I don't think. But um, I think they have a deep respect for Americans and Americans for the English as well. Because we, we've got a lot to... We've got a lot of things to uh, say, you know, for, for each other. I mean, we both have some pretty deep uh, roots, and uh, I think it goes back and forth. Do you think that um, when when you guys were playing this new sound in England, was it the first time the English had heard this? I mean, had they been exposed to the Carl Perkins and the Eddie Cochran's like we had? Now, the, the the English have always regarded Eddie Cochran and Gene Vincent, and the word rockabilly was always in the vocabulary was always in the forefront so there were a lot of rockabilly bands around you make a noise again Billy Bob well there was always a lot of rockabilly bands in the, in the English background not in the foreground I mean they had a group of people called Teddy Boys Kind of that. That's what I got called when I went there. I didn't even know what the word meant, you know. But these people that kind of lived this life, you know, and, and, and knew all these rockabilly people, and that's what inspired me to uh, go there. I'd met an, an Englishman who was a, a Teddy boy who wanted to bring us over to England, just saying, "Oh, you guys would be great. You know, they would love you. You've got original songs." And, but they definitely had their own rockabilly bands. They had people there before. When did? Uh do you remember when you first met Dave Edmonds? I met Dave Edmonds backstage at a gig at the venue in London. Yeah. Were you, were you aware of his work and his sound at the time we met him? I was. Uh, I wasn't. I didn't have you know all his record, like his real earliest stuff. I wasn't really too hip with, but uh, his recent things I was. And um, how much do you think that he added to your sound? Dave took away that demo tape quality, which is not a, which is kind of a deficit really, it's not really an asset. And he kind of made it sound modern. You know, I mean, the perfect definitive answer, the, the, the definitive song would be Runaway Boys. It just doesn't sound like anything that would ever come out of the 50s. I mean, it's a modern song. Dave just had a knack for doing that. What, um, what, what do you think was, which, which do you think best portrayed Stray Cats, your live performances or your records? Oh, live. I mean, still, I mean, I'm a live performer. People say, wow, you know, I really like your record, but man, it's, it, it's like too bad it doesn't sound like it does live. But that's not, that's not the point, you know. I mean, if you ever listen back to a live tape, you would be maybe a little disappointed because it's the whole environment. It's, it's getting down in front and getting excited and getting sweaty. And I think that's what, what rock and roll will always mean to me is, you know, getting, getting sweaty and getting, you know, wild and getting crazy at a show. I mean, I do it for other people, <laughs> you know. I think probably one of, the, one of the most impressive things I've ever seen watching you three guys at Giant Stadium for Willie Nelson's 4th of July picnic the year we did it at Giant Stadium. It was about 114 degrees on that stage. And you guys played for an hour and 10 minutes and you never stopped. It was an incredible experience to watch. <laughs> I had a suit on and the whole thing. Exactly. Yeah, that, that was hot. Yeah. That was just... It that was... It was, uh, you know, it was funny because Willie... Willie Nelson called us up and asked us to play on, on some shows. We did about four or five shows. And uh, 
we at first said no because we just thought it was, well, his um, booking agency calling our you know booking agency and you know the, the lawyers would contact us. But Willie really expressed interest. He really wanted us to play. So we thought we'd we'd give it a shot, and it really worked. It was it was really different. A lot of fun. I'd say that there'd be some similarities in the audiences. Well, I'll tell you, Atlanta Speedway, when we, when we played Atlanta Speedway, it was like 50,000 cowboy hats, right? And we get up there, and we're all skinny with tattoos. We just crawl out from under a rock in New York, and we're, you know, smoking. And we just, like, everyone was looking at us. We had, you know, crazy haircuts. And the first quarter of the first song, boom, the PA went out. Beer cane started to come up and all. It was, it was wild. And the PA came on, we started playing, and uh, the, the beer can stopped and the applause started. And it was great. Let's, let's talk about that for just a couple of minutes and why that happened. And about your music with the Stray Cats, and I think even your music now, and Willie's music, and, and you know, John Cougar's music, and Bruce's music, and, and some people that have what I would term as real working class ethics, and it really appeals to the working class. Do you feel that your music is that way? Well, I feel like I'm uh, maybe a little more warped than that. I don't. <laughs> um, whereas, I feel like that I write for a bit of a younger audience, maybe uh, a bit, a little bit more of a punk oriented audience than more of a working class audience um, probably just starting from the way I look and dress to some of the things I sing about I don't think you would hear Bruce sing, sing about really um, I feel a little different than those guys although I feel a lot in common with them um, I just think I come from a little more of a a little more of a punk edge than uh, those guys would. But do you think that your music appeals primarily to that guy who works nine to five and you know wants to go out with his girlfriend on Friday night and it's sort of that blue collar ethic? Is, is that your music? Does it appeal to that person? Or is it hard to say I think I'm my dad or something you know <laughs> and he doesn't come see me anymore <laughs> it's uh, it varies from place to place I mean uh, you know if we're playing in New York or Los Angeles we get like a lot of you know rockers you know people with I hate to use the word but people with maybe punk haircuts or rockabilly haircuts it's more of a a select thing. When we get into the, the heartland of America, it turns more, you're right, it turns more into a blue collar thing. Because there's more people, I think, that actually maybe work here than the coast. You know, on the coast is like in New York or Los Angeles, is people do a lot of different things running around. They're artists, they're musicians. As we get into the center of the states, it seems to get that way. Change, 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 change battery. We should change both. You're good. Yeah? Yeah. What? Right there, right Shooting there. them playing ball? You got the bus and can you get to see the bus too? Yeah, I got the side of the bus. <laughs> this is Brian Setzer and his guitar player Tommy throwing a softball. Excuse me, that's probably a baseball. In the parking lot of the Sheridan Meridian in lovely Indianapolis. Down the yeah. <laughs> <laughs> field the hard one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Oh! <laughs> Come on, we can show off.
That's a pitcher on, man. You definitely have pitchers on. You're always right here. Look at that. <laughs> man. I wasn't a bad pitcher when I was a kid. Oh, man. You got to get a... Oh! Right, that was right in there. <laughs> Where did you grow up playing ball? New York. <laughs> no, I can't pitch, man. I was all-star shortstop one year. That's about it. <laughs> I was always the smallest kid on the team. But I tried. I always played guitar a little better, though, than I played ball. Look at Billy Records, all this crazy stuff. Billy Lee Riley, Flying Saucers, Rock and Roll. All this crazy stuff, you know, that all came out of Memphis in the 50s. Nobody knew what it was. It was just people screaming and yelling and guitars out front. You know, rock and roll. And um, I just thought it would be great, I mean, if, if I could kind of revamp this because it was real rock and roll. I thought it was really valid. I thought I'd really stumbled onto something that if you hear anything, you know, the original Rockabillies and the way we we ever did it was, in, it wasn't very similar. It's similar in, in a certain way and then it isn't. So we, we made it a lot more electric. But I was just thinking, wouldn't it be great? I mean, nobody knows what this music is. And, you know, I would, I would ask my friends if they knew who Eddie, Co Eddie Cochran was, Gene Vincent. Nobody ever heard of these people. And I used to go to these little specialty record shops and buy, like, you know, these specialty rock. Hadn't been discovered. Did, um, how long then did it, was it from that, that point of hearing Gene Vincent on the jukebox until Stray cats happen. How'd you find two other guys who shared your vision? Well, around 77, I guess, I started. Actually, I wandered into a bar pretty drunk one night. And I said, eh, you know, I said, this. The time you heard any rockabilly was on a jukebox and you heard Gene Vincent? Gene Vincent, right. What song was it? Bebop Lula. And, you know, at, at, at the time, the whole punk thing was starting to go down in England, 76, 77. And um, it had worked its way into Manhattan. It certainly hadn't drifted out to Long Island, you know. And I just like the whole energy of it, the whole kind of cutting through all the crap, you know. And um, it was very foreign to me. I didn't really understand it. When I heard Gene Vincent, for some reason, I equated the two as being real simple and real direct and real ballsy. And uh, I just, the music just kind of sent me to the moon. I just thought, wouldn't it be great if I could make this a little more electric, you know? I mean, if it, it,